Good afternoon. Uh, my name, as you heard from Solomon, uh, is James Wintel. I'm a reference specialist in the Music Division of the Library of Congress, and I'd like to talk to you today about Leonard Bernstein's Candide. The Leonard Bernstein collection here at the Library of Congress holds a vast array of primary source material to study the music and life of Bernstein, as well as his colleagues and collaborators. It is one of the most often consulted collections in the Music Division, and so it is being celebrated today. Yes, this event is being held in conjunction with Bernstein's 100th birthday celebration, one of many events across the world doing the same thing, but what makes this symposium unique is the proximity to Bernstein's own words, his own notes, and the evolution of his musical ideas, all of which can be accessed through the Leonard Bernstein collection. So that collection is the star of the show today. Here you see just inside the front cover of Leonard Bernstein's annotated copy of Voltaire's Candide, he jotted down Candide's famous query, what then is the purpose of the world? Which is answered by the pessimistic Martin, to drive us mad. <laughs> this could have very well been applied to Bernstein's own work. What then is the purpose of Candide? Uh, which would have had very much the same answer. A work that was revised, rethought, redacted, reworked, and revived again and again over the course of 32 years. From the 1956 premiere in New York City's Martin Beck Theater to the final revised version first used by the Scottish Opera in 1988, the work went through many changes and absorbed the perspectives of numerous librettists orchestrators, stage directors, <laughs> and librettists, yes. Uh, looking into the history of the work can be labyrinthine at best, and in these situations, it is always best to start at the beginning. Voltaire wrote his novella Candide between July and December of 1758. It was widely influential, being published in Amsterdam, Geneva, and Paris in January of 1759, and appearing in English translation a mere two years later. Voltaire's biting satire was inspired by many real-world events, <laughs> such as the Great Lisbon Earthquake of 1755, which decimated the city and took tens of thousands of lives. The tragedy had a profound effect on Voltaire, and he was especially frustrated by writers of the day who attempted to explain away the senseless tragedy as part of a grand universal plan that we as mere humans simply didn't understand, and that it was by design for the best. Voltaire first used his pen to rebuke those who espoused the tenets of philosophical optimism in his poem on the Lisbon disaster. In the poem, Voltaire rejects the idea that the suffering of man is necessary to enact some unknown greater good, that it is preordained by a higher power. In it, he says, yet in this direful chaos, you'd compose a general bliss for individuals' woes. Oh, worthless bliss, in injured reason's sight, with faltering voice, you cry, what is, is right. Here, Voltaire is speaking directly to Alexander Pope, who famously wrote in his essay on man, all discord, harmony not understood, all partial evil, universal good. And spite of pride in erring reason's spite, one truth is clear, whatever is, is right. <laughs> in reaction to Voltaire's poem, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote a letter to Voltaire, in which he claimed that the Lisbon tragedy had not been caused by God's ambivalence towards human suffering, but by man's misuse of his creation. He wrote, quote, it was not nature's way to crowd together 20,000 houses with six or seven stories each. And if all the inhabitants of this large city had been dispersed more equally, the damage would have been much less, perhaps even nil, end quote. Voltaire's last word in this argument came in the form of Candide, in which Dr. Pangloss is a caricature of the learned philosopher. Using ridiculous hypotheses to explain away any misfortune that befalls him or his pupils, Voltaire lampoons the philosophical writings of both Pope and Rousseau, but most famously, the writings of German philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, whose essay, The Odyssey, 
Essays on the Goodness of God, the Freedom of Man, and the Origin of Evil from 1706 reads, in part, it is thus one must think of the creation of the best of all possible universes, all the more since God not only decrees to create a universe, but decrees also to create the best of all, or in the words of the operetta, proving that this is the best of all possible worlds, with love and kisses, the best of all possible worlds. It is a shame that Leibniz is best known today as the subject of Voltaire's satire rather than for his more impressive accomplishments. He made major contributions to the history of mathematics. He invented one of the earliest mechanical calculators and, perhaps most importantly, at least to me, devised a new cataloging system for books while working as an overseer in the Wolfenbüttel Library. So he was, I suppose, a very good person since he was a librarian himself. <laughs> <laughs> Voltaire's Candide is a scathing satire of the political, religious, and social institutions of his time. It is a contemporary work in every sense, portraying events ripped from the headlines. So why was it an attractive subject for an American stage work by Leonard Bernstein and playwright Lillian Hellman in the 1950s? Here is a letter from Lillian Hellman to Bernstein suggesting the idea. In a letter from 1953, Lillian Hellman writes to Leonard Bernstein, quote, Lenny dear, this time I think I have it. I don't know, but maybe. Voltaire's Candide. I think it could make a wonderful combination of opera, prose, songs. Then later she says, I think done right, it could have real style and wit and great importance. The operative word here is importance, since at the time, the country was in the throes of the so-called Red Scare. Hellman herself had the previous year been taken before the House on American Activities Committee. Before she gave her testimony, she wrote a letter to the committee chair in which she agreed to testify concerning her own activities but would not name names and would be forced to take the fifth if she were asked to do so, famously writing, quote, I cannot and will not cut my conscience to fit this year's fashions. Even though I long ago came to the conclusion that I was not a political person and could have no comfortable place in any political group. It is within this social context that the satire of Voltaire began to ring true again. Leonard Bernstein had his own problems with the committee after being named in the infamous Red Channels list issued by the right-wing journal Counterattack in 1950. You heard a little bit about this earlier if you were here for Nick's presentation. The list was meant to expose, quote, domination of American broadcasting and telecasting preparatory to the day when the party will assume control of this nation as the result of a final upheaval and civil war, end quote. So, yeah, that's what was going on. Uh, Bernstein joined his friend Aaron Copeland and his Candide collaborators, Lillian Hellman and Dorothy Parker, on the list and became a target for Senator McCarthy's communist witch hunt. In 1953, Bernstein's place on the list became a serious hindrance to his career when the, New York, uh, the U.S. passport office refused his renewal application based on his supposed communist affiliations. With his debut at La Scala only months away, and this was a situation where Bernstein had been, was at that time the first American conductor invited to conduct an opera at La Scala in Milan. Uh, with that only months away, he hired the politically connected lawyer James McInerney to help him get out of trouble. In order to do this, Bernstein had to sign a long affidavit denouncing his associations with assumed communists and claiming that he, has, that he may have lent his name to causes and organizations casually and without any real knowledge of their purpose. And you can see this affidavit actually online, and, he, and it says in, in the document that um, he never knowingly associated with any subversive group, and if some group, and in his artist's life, he sometimes came in contact with people whose purposes he did not know, and if the government had seen their actions to be subversive in some way, he rejected any association with them. It's what it says in the document. Um, and he signed it to get out of trouble so he could go to Milan to 
conduct, which is perfectly understandable because he had to make a career. So um, that is the situation, two very different ways of handling this committee between Lillian Hellman and, and Leonard Bernstein. For a person of Bernstein's intellect, it must have been extremely difficult to sign a document of that kind, giving the public impression that he was anything but an intellectual. Having narrowly escaped the blacklist, Bernstein was both cautious and angry that he and other artists were being forced to bow under political pressure. However, Hellman and Bernstein had had very different public responses to the House Un-American Activities Committee, and when Hellman proposed Candide as the subject for their collaboration after an opera on the life of Eva Perone was abandoned, so we almost got Evita like 20 years earlier, <laughs> Um, the opportunity to use Voltaire's work to publicly satirize the HUAC was met with some apprehension by Bernstein, de despite his underlying desire to do so. It was not until January of 1954 that Bernstein officially agreed to the proposal of Candide, having first written a letter to Hellman passing on the proposal and tearing it up before he sent it. And you see in a letter to his wife, he says, I am going to accept this, but I wrote the letter and I was going to pass. I, I wasn't going to do it, but I tore up the letter. Like he describes the whole scene. I'm not just making that up. Um, so he uh, tore it up before he said it and then decided to go ahead and do the project. Bernstein was clearly conflicted about the idea from the beginning. Although he agreed to work on the project, it was delayed by the completion of variously planned comp or previously planned compositions until June of that year. Hellman did not want to write the lyrics for Candide, but only the book, and had proposed hiring a good poet to do so. The first person brought on board was Jean Latouche, who had previously finished work on a musical <coughs> called The Golden Apple. This is not a piece that I know, but it sounds very interesting. It's a through-composed musical written in an operatic style and won Best Musical from the uh, New York Drama Critics Circle in 1954. So he was someone who had written, who had written the lyrics for a musical that was very much in the style that they were planning to go toward uh, with Candide, with this uh, golden apple. Uh, so after a few working sessions, uh, over a few months um, in New York City, uh, between Hellman and Latouche and Bernstein, uh, he was uh, dropped from the project after that short period of time. Bernstein and Hellman discussed many options for a new lyricist, including Dor Dorothy Parker, who completed the lyrics for one section of the Venice Gavotte, but found no suitable replacement. Using many of Latouche's lyrics and others that they had written or revised themselves, Hellman and Bernstein produced a draft copy of the piano vocal score titled Music for Candide and submitted it to the Library of Congress on February 23, 1955. And that score you can see on the table uh, over here. It's the big one. Um, this score was done as a, in extreme haste, as you can tell from the first page of the Lisbon opening seen here. And if you look closely here, um, if you've seen Candide or have heard the music from Candide, uh, you might remember what a day, what a day for an auto de fe, <laughs> you know? Um, here we have, let's see if I can do my, yeah, two girls with a dog. And what has, what has been written here instead of the proper words, which is what a day, what a day for an auto de fe. It says, what a dog, what a dog for an auto de fe. What a sunny, sunny summer sky, <laughs> which doesn't rhyme nor make any sense. But they had, but they had uh, written two girls with a dog, and then for some reason had gotten stuck on dog, I guess, while they were trying to get this thing done. So you see, you see these kinds of mistakes in the score, which are kind of, uh, I don't know if they're interesting, but at least they're a little funny. Um, <laughs> So for you dog lovers out there, you might want to <laughs> sing this sometime. Um, wisely, they decided to put the project on hold until a new lyricist could be found. Meanwhile, more collaborators were added to the mix when Ethel Linder Reiner agreed to produce the show on Broadway at the Martin Beck Theater and the now legendary Tyrone Guthrie agreed to direct. By December of 1955, they had chosen poet Richard Wilbur as their new lyricist and work began in earnest in May of that year, and within six months, the show was already in tryouts in Boston. And during the Boston tryouts, the show was uh, going through numerous revisions. Um, at that point, many of the pieces were cut, new things were added. It was just a constant 
uh, reworking, reworking, reworking. Um, and after those numerous revisions, uh, the show opened on Broadway uh, December 1st, 1956. Tyrone Guthrie, the director, illuminated the nature of the collaboration in his autobiography, A Life in the Theater. And I'll read a bit of that to you now. From the start, the great risk was that the whole thing would seem wildly pretentious. And that is just what it did seem. Um, only Bernstein's mercurial, elusive score emerged with credit. For my part, I do not at all regret the skirmish. It was an artistic and financial disaster from which I learned almost nothing about anything, but it was fun to be closely associated with a group so brilliantly and variously talented. Bernstein's facility and virtuosity are so dazzling that you are almost blinded and fail to see the patient workmanship, the grinding application to duty which produces the gloss. This may not be an original or creative genius, but if I ever have seen it, the stuff of genius is here. Hellman fought this battle with one hand tied behind her back. This is still Guthrie talking. Hellman fought this battle with one hand tied behind her back. We had all agreed that when necessity demanded, we would choose singers to do justice to the score, score rather than actors who could handle the text, but for whom the score must be reduced. And I, as a singer, understand that this is something that has to happen sometimes. Uh, consequently, line after line, situation after situation, fell flat on its face because, no blame to them, singers were asked to do something for which they had no gift, nor experience, no, nor understanding. Miss Hellman stooped fatally to conquer. None of her good qualities as a writer showed to advantage. This was no medium for hard-hitting argument. Shrewd, humorous characterization, the slow revelations of true values and the exposure of false ones. I wonder if it quality of Bernstein's brilliance. She and I, in an eminent squad of technical collaborators, all seemed to lose whatever share of lightness and gaiety and dash we might possibly have been able to contribute. My direction skipped along with the effortless grace of a freight train heavy laden on a steep gradient. As a result, even the score was thrown out of key. Rossini and Cole Porter seemed to have been rearranging Gotterdemmerung. <laughs> Sorry that quote was so long, but I had to get to the Gutter Demerum part. It was so good. Um, it was clearly Bernstein's show, which did not always serve the greater good. Both Dorothy Parker and Richard Wilbur, on separate occasions, recalled their frustration with Bernstein, who rewrote their lyrics without consultation and felt that his ability as a lyricist was on par with their own, causing a constant conflict. And if you look at the history of the piece, you see the lyricist was fired. Give me a new lyricist. How about another one? How about another one? How about another one? It just kept going on and on. And this is a little view into maybe why that happened. Um, the original production of, oh, sorry. Uh, it was, yeah. Uh, the original production of Candide, which has perhaps unjustly become known as a legendary flop, closed after only 73 performances. Reviews of the show were mixed, but the reception of Bernstein's score was almost uniformly positive. Uh, John Chapman of the New York Daily News wrote, it developed into an artistic triumph, the best light opera, I think, since Richard Strauss wrote Der Rosenkavalier in 1911. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, it is a great contribution to the richness of the American musical comedy stage. Many artists of many skills have had a hand in fashioning Candide, but it is Bernstein's profoundly sophisticated and witty score which puts it in a class by itself on Broadway. Now, this review speaks to what many people believe was the central problem with the first production of Candide, that it was presented on Broadway rather than in an opera house. The lack of a strong love story and easily digestible plot set the show apart from usual Broadway fare and therefore did not translate well for the audience. In addition to the problem of appropriate venue, Lillian Hellman was a notoriously difficult collaborator and fiercely protective of her work, a work which had to be cut and cut and cut and redone and redone and cut again. According to Hubert hum uh, Humphrey Burton's biography of Bernstein, uh, Oliver Smith, the production designer for the show, believed that Ethel Reiner, uh, the producer, had closed the show due to conflicts with Hellman rather than poor ticket sales. 
which were apparently on the upswing after the imminent closing had been leaked to the press. So people were starting to come again to see the show. Um, Smith recalled, quote, Hellman could be very cruel, screaming and yelling at her, and Mrs. Reiner had just had it and said the heck with it and closed the show. After the initial production, the history of Candide becomes even more checkered. Concert versions and revivals were staged. Lillian Hellman was so upset by the changes made to the show along the way that by 1971, legal disputes between Bernstein and Hellman resulted in her name being taken off the show completely. In 1973, a new, completely new book was written by Hugh Wheeler for the so-called Chelsea version of the operetta conceived by Hal Prince. And there's a vocal score for that version also on the table. Uh, this version completely reworked the plot and sequence of numbers including new lyrics to certain pieces by Stephen Sondheim. This leads me to act two of my lecture, which is a brief examination of the piece Candide's Lament. The melody of this aria contains a musical theme that is associated with the character of Cunegonde, or Candide's feelings about Cunegonde, and recurs throughout the operetta. Depending on which production you're watching, uh, it occurs in the Paris Waltz, the Quartet finale of Act One, briefly in the duet "You Are Dead, You Know," "You Were Dead, You Know," and in the finale of the piece "Make Our Garden Grow." Unfortunately, Candide's lament was cut from the original production after the Boston tryouts and did not reappear until a revival of the work in 1966. It is, however, present in the original copyright deposit score from 1955, which you see over there, and a holograph score and sketch of that version with the original lyrics by John Latouche are in the Bernstein collection. You can see that over there as well. Uh, depending on which production of Candide you have seen, you may or may not be familiar with the placement of Candide's Lament. In the original 1955 score, predating the original Broadway production, this show opens with the familiar lesson scene, Best of All Possible Worlds, after which Westphalia <coughs> is attacked by the Bulgarian army during a brief instrumental cleverly titled Battle Music. And all are thought dead except Candide, who finds, Cunegonde, who finds Cunegonde's body and sings his now famous lament while the king of the Bulgars looks on. In the original version, the king provides spoken commentary throughout the song, as you can see here. So we have uh, Cunegonde, Cunegonde, and here you have the, the uh, written dialogue that's spoken by the Bulgar king. Um, the voice is young, thus his <laughs> love is young. Cunegonde, uh, uh, da 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 Cunegonde, oh my love, Cunegonde, oh my lovely Cunegonde, which is the original John Latouche lyric, not what we would have heard more recently. Um, and he talks about the Bulgar king gives his commentary throughout, um, giving you uh, here's some more of the piece, and yeah. Uh, sort of giving you the perspective of an older person saying this is a young love, he's just coming to understand his feelings and all this sort of thing. And then at the end of the aria, after he's sung this you know, beautiful thing, the Bulgar king is standing there and he says, um, he says, now you've made me sad and a sad Bulgar is a dangerous Bulgar, get out of here, you know, and sort of gets him, you know, gets him on his way and then Candide you know, journeys various places throughout the show. Um, so this is the very uh, end of the thing where you sort of see how you know, the, the king is talking over this dialogue. Um, interestingly, here is another sketch of that same version of the aria where you have the king's dialogue notated on pitches. Here you see with rhythmic pitches with X's, which looks like what? Exactly, Sprechstimmen. So it looks as if um, he was going to have the king, you know, at least in one conception of how this aria was going to go, he was going to have the king sort of speak in, in Sprechstimmen in, in this kind of quasi sort of operatic thing. Um, so interesting there. Um, and then later, uh, a sketch, another sketch, and this actually in the Bernstein collection is, um, it's with the the Candide material, but it's just called Candide Reject, which I thought was kind of a funny <laughs> funny name on the folder for it. It doesn't say, you know, it's a version of Candide's Lament or anything like that. This is Candide Reject, so <laughs> apparently they didn't like this one. 
Uh, but this is uh, Bernstein just starting to work out the new lyrics to the aria uh, by Richard Wilbur. And so you have um, Cunegonde, is it you? Is it true? Can this thief be you? And it's, it's much shorter phrases in this and more words than, than we know in the, in the current version of it. But what is consistent throughout is the musical theme. Bum, 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 which goes throughout the entire opera. That theme that we hear in, uh, in Candide's Lament is then in the opera throughout. And that's a little bit of what we're going to get into now. Um, the opening theme of Candide's Lament, the rising octave followed by descending whole step and then half step, becomes a unifying musical theme throughout the operetta. But this melody is not, was not conceived specifically for Candide. Uh, in fact, uh, Bernstein used the same melody for a short piano piece that he wrote in honor of a pianist friend named Cesarina Riso. It was also used as part of his short set of four piano pieces uh, for Sabras, and in that set of piano pieces, it is entitled Lana the Dreamer. Um, the exact date of the composition is not known, but here we go. Um, this is what it looks like. The exact date of the composition is not known, but it's thought that it was written in the early 50s, because if you look at the staff paper that it's written on, right at the bottom, it says, Wonderful Town. So the staff paper, he, you can see that the staff paper he was using for, to write Wonderful Town, he took an extra piece of it and wrote this, this uh, new piano piece. So um, that is uh, at least some indication of where this came from. It's one of the great things about looking at primary resources is that you look at the notes and you think, oh, this is like this other tune, that's neat. And then you look down at the bottom of the page on the actual paper itself and you all of a sudden know, have an idea of when something was written that you maybe didn't know before. So um, interesting in that way. Um, and so um, looking at this piece, you hear um, the, uh, the music, basically, of Candide's Lament. And um, I'd like to welcome uh, John Kaltfleisch to the piano um, so we can hear um, how this melody manifested itself in uh, Cesarina Riso. Please, John, thank you. John Masseri identified the opening theme of Candide's Lament uh, as the, quote, Cunegonde theme when the show was revised for a 1988 production at the Scottish Opera, in which he placed Candide's Lament back in its original position at the beginning of the operetta, without the commentary of the Bulgarian king, uh, but successfully restoring the thematic unity uh, that that aria introduces. 
The other appearances of the theme have similar significance in the development of the Candide and Cunegonde relationship. The Paris Waltz uh, precedes revelations about Cunegonde's fate, You Were Dead, You Know, is sung during their brief reunion, and in the quartet finale, Candide sings the theme of his lament while Cunegonde uh, is singing completely unrelated material, uh, which the two of them singing unrelated material sort of gets to the heart of their relationship in a <laughs> all too true way. Um, and it appears again uh, when they are finally reunited for better or for worse uh, in the finale, Make Our Garden Grow. It is also worth noting that in the 1973 Chelsea version um, that Hal Prince put together, um, Candide's Lament appears in that show under the title This World uh, with completely new lyrics uh, by Stephen Sondheim and they may be, in fact, the most depressing lyrics that I've ever heard in my life. They go as follows. Uh, is this all then? Is this all then? This the world? Death and envy, greed and blindness. What is kindness but a lie? What to live for but to die? I would never miss the world, never this one which is hateful. Let me die then, only grateful. Kunagonda dying sooner was spared this world. What is kindness but a lie? What to live for? but to die. Oh my gosh. Um, so Richard Wilbur's version that begins Kunagonda, Is It True, uh, is still, thankfully, the most commonly heard lyric. Um, the so-called Kunagonda theme is not only used in its original form throughout the operetta, but it is also transformed. In the finale, Make Our Garden Grow, the theme from Candide's Lament is played in the instrumental opening, as everyone heard, hears when they listen to the piece. Um, however, it may not be apparent that the opening vocal line of Make Our Garden Grow is in fact a subtle alteration of the same melody. Uh, Bernstein fills in, um, here we go, uh, he fills in the octave, bum, 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 right? He fills in the octave uh, with a perfect fourth. Um, bum, 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 is how Make Our Garden Grow goes, right? So, bum, 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 and bum, 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 bum. It's the same, same pitches, right? Uh, just slightly different rhythm. Uh, so he fills in the, the octave leap, uh, beginning uh, the theme with a perfect fourth, uh, which, coincidentally, since that octave leap is done on the dominant chord in the key, um, that tonic pitch, a fourth up from the dominant, is in, is in fact the tonic of the key, uh, rather than a perfect fifth, which would outline the chord itself. So basically he has a B minor chord and he puts in an E, which is the tonic of, of the key that the B, mi the B major minor seventh chord, the dominant chord, is supposed to resolve to. So he puts in the resolution at the dominant point, right? So he fills that in in the melody. Um, this is followed by ascending whole step and half step as in the original theme, though the rhythm has changed. The Kunagonda theme has previously been associated with despair and uncertainty throughout the operetta. With this new transformation, it adds the stability of the tonic pitch to anchor the otherwise precarious opening octave leap. The theme takes on a new meaning at that point. Candide has finally found contentment in his life on the farm and a lasting relationship with Cunegonde. He has, not to put too fine a point on it, found his harmonic home, which is the tonic note in this key that he's getting into in the garden, to make our garden grow. Uh, this was most likely done instinctually by Leonard Bernstein rather than intentionally, but I hope that my hypothesis can add an extra layer of meaning to this already stunning finale uh, the next time you listen to it. Make Our Garden Grow is, in fact, one of the great showpieces uh, in Candide and one that is regularly performed for opera scene recitals and gala events. Due to budget constraints, uh, we were not able to hire the entire cast of Kennedy Center's <laughs> production of Candide to come here and sing it for you. However, we do have a special performance of a short musical valentine that Leonard Bernstein wrote for his children, Jamie and Alexander, with a melody that you may recognize. Uh, ben, if you could join us and do that for us. Thank you. There never was a girl like my little girl, so warm, so cool, so candle bright. There 
There never was a boy like my little boy, so strong, so filled with laughter light. If I were poor and useless and ill, my life would be still. Was my little girl and my little boy are so much more than I bargained for, more than passing pleasure, passion, and joy. We have a few extra minutes uh, in between lectures, but honestly, I don't want to follow that with anything else. Just think about that, enjoy it, let it sink in. All right, thank you very much.